probably wonder. I was in Hawaii, and they called me and uh, said, we need you to make Monday Night Raw in Calgary. And uh, I was like, I'm in Hawaii. And uh, they said, it's going to be Bret Hart Day, and it's going to be a really big thing for you. And I said, well, I don't get home till Tuesday, the day after Monday Night Raw. And uh, I didn't really want to. You know, I was happy in Hawaii. I was on vacation. You know, I didn't think it was any kind of a big deal. And uh, then I thought about it. I said, well, I could change my ticket one day. It's not going to make a big difference. I get in about noon on uh, the, the Monday for Raw. And I thought the way I understood it was just a little um, ceremony for me after the show was over when the people were leaving. They were like the last thing of the night, we were going to Bret Hart Day, and I come out and I get a little uh, citation or something like that. But I didn't think it was any kind of a big deal. I didn't know that they'd gone to all that trouble. So if you ever watched that, I, mean, I showed up with a T-shirt, and <laughs> I didn't really care. And all of a sudden I find out that it's the mayor's made it Bret Hart Day and they're giving me the key to the city and it's a special, it was really a big honor and they went to a lot of trouble and I went out to the ring that night. I didn't know Shawn Michaels was gonna come out and I didn't know Vince McMahon was coming out. I didn't even know Vince was there. And uh, when I went out to the ring, I thought it was like, thanks everybody, see you later and I'm gonna walk back to the dressing room and all of a sudden it's like, turns into this big production, which was quite moving and quite stirring for me. I really uh, appreciate it. I thought it was a great, um, you know, a nice gesture on Vince's part. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the thing about Sean, when we buried the hatchet in the ring, people wonder what's real sometimes in wrestling, and I can assure you that that was real. Um, I met Sean, I hadn't seen Sean since Survivor Series, and for most of the next, I don't know how many years it was since uh, the screw job, but I, I woke up every day wanting to get my hands around Sean's neck, like to the point that it was, it was holding me back. I was, I was too angry for my own good and I, and I knew that. It's like, you, there's nothing you can do about it and don't, don't stress out over it. I, I wonder sometimes I've had my stroke and things like that related to Owen's death and uh, <clears throat> Davey's death, which was about 10 days before I had my stroke. and and all the stuff that happened with the screw job. <clears throat> you learn that you gotta, can't carry around all that baggage because you end up carrying it around in your own heart and it sours your, poisons you from the inside. And uh, <clears throat> so I really did want to make peace with Sean. And I remember I texted him and told him that not to worry, that I'd, you know, just to come find me when he got there. And he did come find me. And I remember I talked to him for about 10 seconds and I, I stopped him, I said, let's, let's not do any of this right here. And the, it was in catering, in the catering room. I said, let's do this for real. <clears throat> and in the ring. And uh, so when you see me shake Sean's hand in the ring, all that's pretty real. There's no scripted um, stuff going on. And it was very, I think Sean was pretty worried that it would come off the way it would. I, I don't think anyone was really sure what was gonna happen. But I always feared that um, I would think back a couple months after that, that and realize that Sean was hadn't changed, that he was still a dickhead, and that uh, that Christian or no Christian, he was not worthy of uh, making peace with, and that I re would regret it, really, really badly regret it, and feel like I sold out, and that I made a big mistake, and but I I thought that at the time, and I thought, well, only way I'm going to no, it was in a few months from now. And uh, I remember shaking Sean's hand. And I always like to tell people, like when you make peace with somebody that you've hated or you really have a hard feeling for, you can't make peace halfway. There's no such thing as halfway with peace. You either have to make peace all the way or you gotta keep going to war. But don't, you can't do it half-assed. You gotta do it, you gotta either be, be honest with yourself and make peace or, or not let it go. And. Uh, I shook Sean's hand and uh, we made peace and I figured that things would fall apart in a few months. But you know, I, I can say with, uh, with some satisfaction that it was, it was the right thing to do. Sean, um, I think I lifted a million pounds off his back and for the next few months that I saw Sean, he was, he was so grateful every time I ever saw him that, that we were friends again and that there was no more, he didn't have to worry about me jumping out of a bush or something to get him. Or, and um, 
you know, I, I think I learned a lot through that whole experience that forgiveness is a good thing and that um, if I can set that kind of an example <clears throat> for my fans, then that's a good, that's a good message. That's a bloody good message. Um, I'll come around and ask one or, get one or two of you to ask a question or two in a minute, but I just want to say this is the fourth night on the trot that I've had the great privilege and honour of uh, working with this great man. Uh, I consider you very much a friend now. I really do. You're a great guy. Great guy. A really good human being, as you've just heard. Fantastic wrestler. And uh, I know I'm not with you in Birmingham tomorrow. I wish you all the best. I'm sure you're going to. I know you're in good hands. And uh, I want to now just give one or two of you an opportunity. Are you going to do it? Fair enough then. Yeah, cheers. You want to ask a question? Thank you, John. Thanks for the whole week. Sure. Brett, if you had the chance of being in a tag team partnership or working with a wrestler from the present or the past, who would that be and why? I mean, as a tag partner? Yeah. Um, well, if I could have a tag partner, it's kind of a kind of a odd question because I, if they came, somebody came to me and said, "Look, we're going to put you in tag team," I'd be like, "No, you're not. You know, like, I don't want to be in tag team with anybody." So, I, I, from that standpoint, I don't think it would happen. But in a perfect world, I guess if I could find one guy to be my partner, I think Undertaker or Steve Austin would be about the best, the only logical choice. Or maybe Shawn Michaels in the right storyline. You know, it would be, be interesting to, to have done that. But uh, that would be about the best answer I can give you. One here. Brett. Hi, Brett. Um, when you've been traveling around from show to show, country to country, what's the craziest um, story that happened? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of them. I, I don't even know where to start. I love... Um, I had some good Yoko stories. Uh, <clears throat> um, I think um, I think my most fun memories are um, are overseas. Um, I had a lot of fun traveling around. I, I really loved uh, you know back in '94. Uh, I think we worked in India. And uh, that was a really fun trip. Uh, you know, Africa was another one that was a lot of fun. I remember um, in India, uh, when we were all wrestled there, everybody got sick and food poisoning from different things in the water and stuff. And uh, I remember the first night, Yoko was a little, feeling a little under in the weather in uh, the dress room. And he was a big cranky elephant that had really bad, um, had the runs really bad. And uh, he was a big sourpuss that night, in more ways than one. And uh, I remember wrestling with him in the ring and working with him. And I think somewhere about the 10 minute mark, I remember watching him climb up on the second rope and he was getting, climbing all the way up and the back of his trunks were shit stained. <laughs> it looked like he sat in a big puddle of pea soup. And I remember like looking at it, and he was coming for the big bonsai drop. <laughs> and have you ever thought I moved out of the bonsai drop? That was the fastest I ever moved. And I remember he left a big, a big brown stamp in the ring where he bounced off his butt and fell in the ring. I remember there was a big brown stamp on the ring of, uh, stamp of approval. But uh, anyway, um, <laughs> you know, Yoko, uh, he was really sick that night, and uh, a lot of guys got sick on that tour. But uh, I have a I just thought of another story. I remember one time I was in the Cap Center in Washington, and uh, the Undertaker and me were talking, and uh, just around the corner, and all of a sudden it was in the next, like we were about a 30 feet from, 20 feet from the bathrooms, and uh, we were the closest ones to the bathroom. 
And all of a sudden, it, it really did sound like someone had washed a, like flushed a hand grenade or something down the toilet because it was a big explosion and a big, like a big bang and crash. And I remember thinking, like me and Undertaker both looked at each other like, what was that? <laughs> And we didn't really know what it was. I thought somebody really did flush a firecracker down the toilet or something. And we went around the corner to look, and I think, I don't know who was first, me or Undertaker, but we came around the corner, and there was poor Yoko, all seven or 800 pounds of him, sitting at a pile of broken porcelain and, <laughs> and poop everywhere. He had a big gash in his butt cheek. Uh, and I remember he was near tears like he was in the in the puddle and he had poop all over him and he was like give me a hand and he's like and i remember undertaker like hey brother you know we're all like trying to pretend we're like hey you know god you know that's terrible and he had his hand up and it's like i remember i'm not getting his hand <laughs> but we we turned around i remember it was really funny because um undertaker i remember him plugging his nose like this just laughing like around the corner and then turning back and going that's terrible and all that. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, there was a lot of funny things about wrestling. Uh, I had a lot of funny memories that way. I can remember one time um, we were on a flight from somewhere in New York all the way to Hong Kong, I think it was. That was a really long flight. It was for, it took forever to get there, but I remember when we were getting on the plane and we're all in business class, most of the wrestlers and a bunch of serious businessmen up there and stuff like that and I remember I think one of the businessmen had commented as as uh, Scotty Steiner was putting his bags over the overhead I think he got annoyed and said like don't don't squish my jacket or something like that something simple and I remember Scotty Steiner looked at him and proceeded to beat him over the head with pillows for about 30 seconds and uh, don't worry about your jacket kind of thing and uh that was how the flight started to take off. Like that, then we left and took off for, for Hong Kong. And I slept the whole flight. I remember sleeping and sleeping. But every once in a while I'd wake up and it was like a, a wild party up in first class with people throwing stuff, food fights. Everybody was drunk. There was people that were asleep with shaving cream piled up on their heads and businessmen that we didn't even know with shaving cream piled up on their heads. And it was a real fiasco. And, uh, I can remember being at the door of the plane with the pilot, or the, the pilot, but the stewards and the stewardesses and all that. They were all sick of every one of the wrestlers and mad. Everyone was mad. And the front of the airplane had a kind of a stinky, sweaty odor to it from all the, the bodies and stuff pressed up against the door. And I just remember Owen looking at me, had that little smirk on his face. and. Uh, I remember as we were kind of looking at each other, he goes, these businessmen, are, they hate our guts. <laughs> they, and I just remember around the time he said that, he, like, he was wanting me to look at look how mad that one businessman is. And you could hear, I think it was Yoko or somebody let out a really loud kind of stinky fart, like in the background. It was like, and it came out kind of with a sound to it. Like, and I remember like that businessman, is, it was like, ah. He, he, I'm sure he got off the plane and said, don't ever watch wrestling and don't you ever, you know, he, he must have hated all of us by the end of that trip. <clears throat> but some of the funniest things I can think of with um, wrestling were um, like the funny things traveling around with the midget wrestlers and, you know, even when I first started wrestling, I can remember when I was just the referee driving and... Uh, we broke down about 20 miles out of town from the town we were supposed to work in and uh, I was frantic as I got everyone out of the bus. I said, look, nobody's going to pick up a bunch of wrestlers trying to hitchhike 20 miles into town. So everybody just sort of hunched down in the ditch here, stay in the ditch and let me be like the one kid sort of up hitchhiking and someone might stop for a kid, but they're not going to stop for a bunch of guys six foot four that all look like gorillas and stuff like that. So I had all the wrestlers kind of hunched in the ditch. <clears throat> and um, I said we had midgets on that trip. We had a Japanese midget and a little, little cowboy midget. And we had, you know, some really large black wrestlers. And we had um, Japanese wrestlers that looked like Mongolian, Genghis Khan kind of guys. And 
shaved heads, and it was a real, real ugly crew of wrestlers, kind of. And I remember I was sticking my thumb out, and the car, little car pulled over. It was an old car with a little old lady and a little old man in the front seat. <clears throat> and um, I remember I opened the door, and I said, I said, uh, I broke down, and uh, we need a ride into town. I, I have some friends with me. <laughs> And before I could give the rest of the cue to kind of come up, and I, thought I wanted to stay down until I kind of explained what was going on. But they didn't wait for me. They all just jumped up. But I remember they're all running. Like I can remember like looking as I was talking to this old guy. I see this mob of about 15 wrestlers charging, like running as fast as they can to the car. And like I say, they're, they're all different colors and sizes. They're all big. And then the midgets. And it was a, it was a sight. And I remember the... That old guy just floored it. The wife was screaming, and I'm hanging onto the door, and I'm going, "It's not like you think. Don't go, don't go." And I remember they all they, they drove off with the door open, leaving me on the side of the road. He was so scared, and I always I remember turned around, and I was just the referee in those days, and I remember turned around, and I said, oh, "I was only about 19 or 20," and I like, gave all these guys shit. And I'm like, "What the hell are you doing? You can't, you can't front up. You got to stay in the ditch. No one's gonna stop." And it was just funny. You know, those kind of memories. Um, that was the beauty of wrestling. It was a different different adventure every day. It's uh, 20 to 12, so this is going to be the last question. And I've, we could listen to you all day, but this guy spent like 1,200 quid on a belt, so <laughs> I think we should let him ask the last question. But before we do, ladies and gentlemen, can I have just a show of appreciation for John Gwynn for his skills tonight? I think it's all. And our guests, Paul Nicholson and John Shipley, thank you for coming. <laughs> Just ask Paul, who you got? Are you in the Grand Slam, Paul? Oh, no, you're not. No, sorry. I should have worked. Sorry. Because <laughs> you didn't qualify. Anyway, last question from this. I'll give it up, I promise. Brett, he's over there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Brett, I think everyone respects you tonight, but we've got two questions from the table. One is from our friend here: What's your greatest match? And my question is: What do you make of the current product? Well, um, greatest match is really hard, and you know, I think a lot of fans and a lot of people here are probably familiar with. Um, Wembley and Iron Man and Steve Austin. I put those would be probably my three greatest WWE matches. And Owen would be right in there and perfect. And even Kevin Nash at the Survivor Series. And I can just go on. Like there was a lot of really um, stellar matches that I can, you know, even the match I had with One Two Three Kid on Raw was a f great match. And I know a lot of people say that was a, one of my f their favorite matches of mine. <clears throat> but I do think that the greatest match, maybe the greatest match I ever had was with uh, the Dynamite Kid. And I think it was, um, I wrote about it in my book. We had uh, our very first ladder match. And I, I just remember um, during that match, I, me and Dynamite were fighting like, like a, like a, knockdown drag out kind of match and in those days you start fighting and then you eventually go and get the ladder and you bring it in the ring <clears throat> and um, when I was wrestling dynamite we were fighting and having this match and I remember I fought him out on the floor and I took him to the back of the arena kind of to the off to the side of the ring and I went to run him in the wall and I, I ran him into the wall and he took a big you know he put his hands up and hit the wall and then I went to bang his head on a chair, and I banged his head on a steel chair, and he put his hands up. But he hit the chair so hard with his hands that he bounced back with the back of his head and shattered my nose. I just, it would like I would have to compare it to somebody picking up a rock about the size of a guy's head and just and just getting about a few feet from your face and just going, and it it sh shattered my nose, and I can remember. 
I could actually, in the dressing room after, I could, could have if I wanted to. I didn't do it. But I, mean, I could have stuck my baby finger right in my nostril from this side. And I shattered it all across here. And I remember when I first got in the business, I promised my mom, who started crying when she heard I was going to be a pro wrestler. And I remember I told her, told her, what about your nose? <laughs> I said, don't worry about my nose. I'll never break my nose. And so anyway, I broke my nose that night, shattered it. I remember even in the ring when I was wrestling Dynam, I said, how does it look? And it's not very reassuring when you ask the wrestler you're working with how it looks, and he looks at you and goes, oh. It looks, it's fucking bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I knew then, I was like, I, I thought I destroyed my, uh, my good looks. I was, and I felt terrible. I mean, it was a lot of pain. But I remember I was so mad at myself, mad at dynamite. And the fans, there was this bloodlust in the crowd. They just, it was, and it was such a violent match. I remember dynamite pile driving the chair kind of like dynamite was the one that came up with a tombstone pile driver if anyone ever wants to know that's dynamite kid um, undertaker and everybody else that's a that's dynamite kid that invented that move and uh was not called the tombstone um but he picked up that steel big steel ladder and i remember i was lying in the ring with my face shattered and i remember dynamite standing over my head and I thought, oh my God, he's actually going to try to drop this big steel ladder that weighed about 50 pounds. He's going to try to drop it on my head. And in wrestling, you know when somebody does something like that, that you can't move once he's in it. So I'm lying there, we're like lying flat on my back, watching this lunatic drop this big steel ladder on my face. And I, remember I lay there, and my kid jumped up in the air with that tombstone. And he dropped that ladder right on my face without touching my, like it never touched my head, but I could feel it touch my head, but he never hurt me. And <clears throat> I knew then, and as I've always said all these years, that Dynamite Kid was one of the greatest wrestlers that ever lived. He was such a pro when he wanted to be. And at that point in time in our career, we were pretty good friends, and he had a lot of mutual respect for one another at, by this time. And uh, I knew that he totally protected me on that kind of stuff. And uh, we just had such a great match that night. But I remember when I was climbing the ladder to the ring, and I actually have a photograph of it at home. Um, I remember climbing up to grab the money. I think the picture might even be in my book. But uh, I was so mad at the crowd and myself, and I hated myself for what happened. And the, the blood, I was bleeding everywhere, and my nose was shattered. And I was getting 50 bucks. That was my pay for the night. And I had a... 500 mile drive home and I was climbing up that ladder and I remember I was like almost like cussing out the fans like I was sick of everything sick of what I was doing and being hurt and <clears throat> climbing up a ladder like that and um, you know you always think <clears throat> how um, you know how stupid you are to um try so hard to make people believe something that's fake is real for their entertainment. <clears throat> but I remember climbing up slowly up to get the ladder, to, to get the money or whatever it was that was in the match. And uh, I can remember I was like, really was um, thinking like, why am I doing this? And what a stupid job and what a stupid way to make a living. <clears throat> But uh, when I did get to the top and I, I grabbed the money or whatever it was that was hanging there, I think it was a belt or money or both, and uh, got the, won the match. And I, I remember even then the pop, we call it a pop, like the explosion. And it was only a building of maybe, maybe 2,500 people or 1,500 people, that building. And I can say to you now that I think that crowd and that reaction and the, that match itself was probably <clears throat> one of the most um, beautiful violent matches that you could ever watch um, more so than even WrestleMania 13 with Austin but it was um, I'm sure anybody that watched that match would have went home that night going I don't care what you say about wrestling that match was real That's for your second part of the question. Um, who do I like today? 
uh, the wrestlers and the product. I think a lot of the product. I think there's some phenomenal wrestlers out there today. Um, I'm a big fan of CM Punk. I'm sure a lot of guys are. I thought he was uh, an exceptional talent, and I thought he really raised the bar in the last, like, I don't know how many wrestlers in the last 10 years that I give that much credit to. A lot of them are just other wrestlers, but I don't know that anybody really raised the bar too much uh, in the last few years since I stopped wrestling, like going back to 2000, 2001 on. The wrestling was a lot of repeat, repeat of guys, other ideas and things like that. There wasn't a lot of innovation and new stuff. But I thought CM Punk really raised the bar. Um, and I thought Daniel Bryan has been just a, he's a great talent. He reminds me a lot of Owen. He reminds me of Owen, his uh, demeanor and his sort of calm, quiet little personality that he's got. He really is kind of an easygoing, kind of quiet little kid like Owen was. And... Uh, I love the way he wrestles. He does a lot of Owen stuff, the drop kicks off the top, the nip ups. And I, whenever I watch him, I go, there's a little bit of Owen in everything that Daniel Bryan does. And I love that about him. Cesaro, the English wrestler that uh, is working in the States. I kind of hate what they're doing with him right now just because they sh they're not doing enough with him. If they are doing anything with him, I, he did some great stuff. The Andre the Giant Battle Royal, that was a phenomenal ending and uh, how he picked up the big show and threw him over the top rope was just great stuff. I loved it. When I watched it, I went, that's, that's new, breaking new ground. Nobody's uh, picked up a guy like Andre and just, or you know, a guy like Andre or a guy like Big Show and heaved him over the top rope. That was pure strength, real strength and uh, he's a bona fide talent. He's a great wrestler. And, what I love about Cesaro is he's, um, he's a real throwback to the great English wrestlers from, from over here, like Jeff Ports and Billy Robinson and Les Thornton. I'm not sure how many of you guys remember those guys, but they were all phenomenal wrestlers, world-class, best-in-the-world type of wrestlers, and uh, Cesaro is just as much an equal to those guys. He's a real throwback to Pat O'Connor and the technical, smooth. He's such a smooth, flowing kind of wrestler. He flows from one move to another. And uh, that's, that's great stuff. I really, really love that. You know, I think the wrestling today, um, I really am a big fan of it and I watch a lot of it, but I, I'm just kind of sick of a lot of the wrestlers in the sense that they, they're all very um, identical to each other. Like everybody's, Everybody's wrestling the same style now, and everybody seems like they're about 210 pounds, and they're all little muscular, skinny guys that are whipping around the ring and doing millions of choreographed high spots and moves where they're leaping and jumping and diving, and nothing ever looks real. Where I go, nobody would ever fight like that in a real fight. And that's what, yeah, that's what I think is missing. The wrestling is becoming very choreographed and very rehearsed, and that sucks after a while because it doesn't look real and it just looks, it's exciting maybe, but I, I think you gotta, you know, like I said, when you see me punching Steve Austin and he's bleeding in the corner and I'm beating him and punching him one punch after another and then you see me stand there and Steve Austin just kick me right in the crotch and I fall backwards. I mean, it's, it's realism and it's great drama and when it looks, when it pulls you in and it's real, but when it, you see wrestlers, so many wrestlers, I, like I said earlier, they get a fail for talking in the ring. They get a fail for um, jumping up with a big punch and missing the guy's head by this much. Or, you know, there's too much of that going on. And too many of the guys in the back that are the trainers or the agents or the sort of supervisors of wrestlers are so unskilled or unknowledgeable about what you need to do to change your wrestling style to become better or how to help these young wrestlers improve. I, mean, I don't know how many years it's going to take for someone to take John Cena around the corner and say, hey, John, that punch you do in the middle of the ring where you jump up and you miss the guy's head by this much, <laughs> please stop doing it. Just stop doing it because it looks so bad. But uh, It's an expose on the business. And you see guys like um, well, Jericho comes to mind, but he's one of those guys that's always talking in the ring and telling everybody, he's whispering in his ear, the Gettysburg Address in the guy's ear and then throwing them off. To me, that's a fail, you know. 
nobody should be talking in the ring. If you can't remember what you're doing, figure it out another way. But you know, it's like a Robert De Niro in the middle, raging bull, going, "Stop!" What's my line? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, well, it's like it's it kills all the the realism of it. And uh, I'm all about that. If you watch my matches, I wanted to give you realism, and I did it. I worked really hard to make you believe that it was real. I know when you went home, you know, driving home at the end of the night, you're going, ah, oh, that wrestling's all a bunch of baloney. But that's what I try to do, is make you, when you drove home, go, I know that wrestling's a bunch of baloney, but that last match was, I think that one might have been real, or some of it was real, or the ending was real, or 61% was real. You know, that's what I try to do, and I, I hope that uh, it showed. Well, all I can say is, you've been 100% real today. Fantastic, folks. A great night for Leicester. A brilliant night here at the King Power Stadium. Brett Hickman. Hi!